Welcome to Freedom in Christ. Another Monday night live and uh, so glad you're tuning in. We've been talking about fear. We've got a few more to go. It's a big subject. It is the number one mental health problem of the world and so it's worthy of the time that we spend on it. It is the most repeated commandment in scripture, fear not. It's the first emotion that Adam expressed after the fall, I was afraid. And uh, there was nothing there to be afraid of and yet that fear, what I call the primordial fear, of being absent from God had just dominated his life at that time. Tonight we're going to look at the fear of death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Ernest Beckner in his Pulitzer Prize-winning book, The Denial of Death, said, The fear of death haunts the human animal like nothing else. It is the mainspring of human activity. Uh, this fear of death is just constantly being stimulated by the environment in which we live, and primarily mass media. You listen to the news every night. If it bleeds, it leads. And some nights you're just going to turn on the television and say, hey, I'm glad you survived. Let me tell you about the few who didn't today. And uh, then we always hear about the new salmonella outbreak or some mass killing or an airplane that goes down and or tornado hits. And then you see images of people tearfully looking through the ruin, trying to find meaningful things that are left there from their life. And and uh, it, it's just kind of a tragedy that, that fear, which is a powerful motivator in our life, can dominate so many lives. This is a forecast looking ahead, but let me just be honest with you. Uh, an irrational fear, fear of something other than it's legitimate uh, and other than God is mutually exclusive to faith in God. Something is controlling my life and it is not God. It is not the spirit of God. And God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love and a sound mind. And so uh, we're going to take a look at this mega problem, the fear of death. That maybe is the biggest stronghold that exists for a lot of people's lives. Uh, the genesis of that surprisingly, is really Satan. And why is that? Why is that the case? Listen to the writer of Hebrews. Since the children share in flesh and blood, Christ likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Think about that for a moment. Who those who had a fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Jesus came to set us free and truth will set us free. But uh, to grab hold of that and to realize that from the very, very beginning, the origin of the fear of death really is the one who had the power of death. And uh, you come across any kind of buddy in spiritual bondage, and I'm going to so tell you about people who have an obsession with death, who have suicidal thoughts, and it's just, it's just part of the, the landscape. We received this testimony in the office to illustrate that. I'm 30 years old. When I was five, my mother and father took me to a witch doctor to help cure my nosebleeds. My parents were to say a few prayers and then place a silver coin on my forehead. Shortly after the nosebleeds ended, I became obsessed with dying. A tremendous fear came over me that would not subside. I accepted the Lord when I was 25. Two years ago, the fear of dying came back full force after giving my testimony at a woman's Bible study study sharing, uh, sharing day. The fear was oppressive. Every day I chose to wear clothes that I thought would be my death clothes. How was I going to die? The thoughts in my mind were petrifying. I would die and my three-year-old daughter would grow up without a mom. I would die and my husband would marry a beautiful blonde. <laughs> were these thoughts coming to him? I asked God to remove the fear. I became familiar with all the fear Bible verses. It was so overwhelming, I thought I was going crazy. Then they came across my book, The Bondage Breaker. And she said, I was in bondage. I remember crying out to God to show me what was holding me back. I prayed the prayers. And when I came to the part of renouncing my sexual sins, I tried to envision every man I ever had sex with, what they looked like or what their names were. I prayed for these men. I prayed that their names were written in the last book of life. I felt the fear of leaving me, the fear of being unworthy to stand before God, the fear of getting AIDS, the fear of dying. This was, may sound funny, but with every prayer, I almost felt a poof coming out of my mind. Then I slowly asked the Lord why this fear had plagued me for so long. And I remembered long ago going to that witch doctor. That, to this day, my mom claims 
was a man of God. I truly believe that curse was placed on my life when I was five. I lived 28 years infested with fear. I didn't care how I lived and became a loose woman because I was sure I'd never live to see the consequences. Thanks be to God from whom all blessings flow. There truly is freedom in Christ. Well, there's a chance that her nose bleeds basically uh, in coincidence healed up after that event. <clears throat> there's another explanation I find rather intriguing, however. Tertullian, around the year 200, wrote the Apology for Christianity. And he said, very kind to, no doubt, demons are in regard to the healing of diseases. For, first of all, they make you ill. Then to get a miracle out of it, they command the application of remedies either altogether new or contrary to those in use and straightway withdrawing hurtful influences, they're supposed to have wrought a cure. How deception is that? deceptive is that? John is a missionary, he's a friend of our ministry. Uh, he uh, spent some time in Africa as a bush pilot. And uh, uh, after two close calls, he actually became agoraphobic. It, it became so intense near the end of his first term, he barely could leave his house. And uh, the seeds of fear, however, were sown much earlier in his life. Listen to his story. After so many years of deception that held me in bondage and fear, I am set free in Christ. Praise his name. At age 14, my hobby was amateur radio. I enjoyed tuning across the bands and finding faraway stations. When lights out time came, I would turn the amateur radio off, get in bed, plug in an earphone to my AM radio, and continue listening for faraway broadcast stations. In time, I located a station in New York State. At 10 p.m., I heard their news, station ID, and the introduction to the next program, the CBS Radio Mystery Theater. From that night for the next four years, I was hooked to that program, falling asleep with images of suspense and fear flooding my mind. If only I'd known what I was setting myself up for. Sometime thereafter, a voice began to tell me just when the phone would ring and who was on the other end without fail. I was able to tell my parents secret habits about people that I knew to be true even when meeting an individual for the first time. Some time in the future, often years later, my folks would remark to each other and ask, how did you know? After I received my driver's license, the same voice would tell me where the speed traps were on the interstate. My mom once told me that during my years of Bible school, I was blessed with tremendous spiritual insight because of all things I knew and could do. Spiritual insight is right, however. It was the wrong kind. Let me just stop here for a moment. This is such a fascinating testimony. I remember one of the first persons I dealt with was an undergraduate student at Biola University, and she could go around the campus and point out people's sins, thinking this was a great gift from God. When she found her freedom, however, that so-called gift was gone. That wasn't from God. Love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't go around and point it out in other people's lives. He said... Now, here's the tip-off for this. It's interesting. Just like this girl, one of the first ones, first ones ever dealt with that told me about voices in the head like this, um, she had such difficulty afterwards because she had never had a clear mind. But even though she thought this was spiritual insight from God, it was ruining her life. And it was in this case here. Not always did the voice tell me the truth. The voice would actually become rough and tell me to burn my arms with my smoldering iron or, or poke out my eyes with a screwdriver. When I would climb my radio tower to repair antennas at 100 feet, the voice would often tell me to jump off. Have you ever stood at a cliff and had this impulsive thought, jump? The battle for my mind at those moments while on the tower was so intense that just trying to keep safety and good practice in front of my mind would cause great debilitating fear. Since that fear began motivating my life daily, my daily activities, Although a voice in my head would often tell me that I was stupid, dumb, ugly, and fat, and would never amount to anything, 90% of the time I told the truth. So I just kept listening to it. You know, can Satan tell the truth? Well, sure he can. He can tell you 90% of the truth. And once you buy into the lie and buy into that avenue, then you'll start introducing the lie. And next thing you know, you've had it and didn't realize it. Well, working through the steps, John realized this voice in his head wasn't from God. And uh, he found incredible freedom. He actually went back to Africa just to pick up his belongings. 
He says, I was there for two weeks and, and people would just spend uh, late into the night telling about all the things that God had done for him in his life. He said, I had more ministry in those two weeks than I had in the previous three years in Africa. Uh, he was a changed man after he was going through the steps. Now, how does God overcome this? Adam was the first living soul. Jesus was the first life-giving spirit. And uh, Jesus, as we know, fully God, fully man, two natures, one person. That's the bedrock of Christianity. In him was the life, and the light was the life of the world. I, I can't overstate how important it is just to realize that what Jesus came to give us was life. That life means my soul is in union with God. This is the basis for Paul's all theology. He was telling you, he said, uh, my beloved brother Timothy, who will tell you my ways, which are in Christ, which I teach in all churches all the time. And you know, that's what Neil Anderson does too. I want to tell everybody who they are in Christ, if they would just begin to believe that, that the answer that we have to overcome the fear of death has been fully supplied. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan in AD 374 to almost four, year 400, uh, said this, in taking upon himself a human soul, he also took upon himself the affections of the soul. As God, he was not distressed, but as a human, he was capable of being distressed. It was not as God he died, but as man. It was in human voice that he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As human, therefore, he speaks on the cross, bearing with him our, air, our terrors. For amid danger, it is very human response to think ourselves abandoned. As human, therefore, he's distressed, weeps, and is crucified. The Apostles' Creed, the first creed written in the first century, says that Jesus descended into hell, which in the Hebrew is the word Sheol. In the Old Testament, there's only one word for death and hell, and that's the word Sheol. In Greek, it's Hades. Understand something. He descended into hell is really kind of a mistranslation because it's not the destination that's important. It is the separation that was important. It was the separation of Jesus' human nature from God the Father, which is what caused him to cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Between the excruciating pain of the crucifixion and the triumph of the resurrection, Jesus took the plunge into the abyss of aloneness, complete abandonment, which is a frightening prospect. The fear that comes from being totally alone speaks to our human vulnerability. We can't rationally explain it away. There's just something about being abandoned or being alone like that. At the moment of that separation, Jesus quoted from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? While the mocking crowd at that time and the first thief had given up their faith in God, Think about it. In the moment of this great distress, our God is praying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Hell is loneliness where no love can penetrate. Heaven is totally in the presence of God where God is love. Hell is separation from God. That's hell. That's death. And uh, if your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that's all then that you would have to look forward to. What an incredible gift we have in salvation. Salvation is the answer for it. Experiencing his presence now is just a taste of heaven. Someday we will be fully in his presence. And I thank God every time I sense God's presence in my life. And even when I don't sense it, I choose to believe and live as though he is present because he is. He's omnipresent. He holds all things according to the counsel of his will. When John, who knew Jesus and was referred to in his own book, Gospel of John, the apostle whom Jesus loved, the one who hailed upon the breast of Jesus in the Lord's Last Supper, the last to remain, the only one not martyred, had his vision in the island of Patmos. And when he saw the fullness and the greatness of God, he just fell to his face. This man who knew God better than any of us, who walked with him, saw him every day in Christ, suddenly fall of the fullness of God and fell to his face. And what did Jesus say? He said, fear not.
fear not. He said, I am the first and the last, I'm the beginning and the end. I die and behold, I'm alive evermore. And I have, listen, I have the keys of death and Hades. Hell is loneliness for no love can leave. There's a fear of that abandonment, of just being alone. You ever walk through the woods by yourself and felt kind of a sense of fear come over you and then have some friend show up and it's almost alleviated immediately? Have you ever gone into a mortuary uh, thinking maybe you were going to see something else and walked in a room and there's a corpse there whom you don't know? Did you feel a little weary, just a little eerie? Probably. Probably wanted to leave. And then another person walks in and suddenly the eeriness is gone. This is no fear of anything in, in particular, but the fear of being alone. Such a fear cannot be overcome by the rational explanation of his groundlessness. The, the dead man cannot hurt you. Uh, that is not the basis for the fear. It explains why so many people struggle with the idea of abandonment. I remember as a kid on the farm, I was very young, but I recall it very clearly. It was a beautiful, warm, sunny day, and I woke up in my nap. And I got up, Mom, no answer, and went downstairs. Dad, where are you? Nobody was there. And, and I started looking around the farm, and I couldn't find anybody. And it's just amazing how quick that fear, you know, just starts to over, overcome you. And then all of a sudden, I saw the, pole, the car pull into the lane, and boom, the fear dissipated immediately. Uh, the ultimate need is eternal life. That's why I call... Uh, the original fear, primordial fear, because it is the ultimate fear. It's what has governed all early civilization to somehow or another seek eternal life. And our natural life has less value than that eternal life, but it is not valuelessness. It still is treasure more than any other earthly possession, because we have to have that physical body. Our soul needs to be in union with our body in order to be able to function on this earth and to have fellowship with other people. Life has no meaning without relationships, if you think about it. The value of being present with another is determined by our capacity to love. There is no fear in love, because perfect love casts out fear. Imagine being raised in a family where there is no love. It would be a living hell, wouldn't it? The good news is, this has all been solved for us in Christ. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. In other words, he will continue to live spiritually, even if he dies physically. In other words, we remain spiritually alive, even when we physically die. Uh, that is not something to fear then, obviously, because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. No more pain, no more fear. Now, that's not a license to commit suicide because we're, we're supposed to be a good steward of the life that God has entrusted to us. And we're going to be accountable for that someday. But the point that I'm trying to make is the one who's free from the fear of death is really free to live today. I'm not afraid to go here or there or wherever else. If I die tomorrow, I'll just be absent from the body present with the Lord. Uh, for me to live with Christ, to die then is actually gain. It's something to look forward to. Somebody to see Christ face to face, to have a resurrected body and to be without pain. I used to think of eternal life as being a great thing when I was young, but then as I got a little older, my body began to creak and muscles began to ache and pain and everything else. I said, who wants to live this way forever? Actually, I don't. <laughs> my, my outer man is decaying, but my inner man is being renewed day by day. I said, so I'm just looking forward to someday to jettison this old earth suit and have a resurrected body and be fully in the presence of God. Folks, that is something really to look forward to. That is the blessed hope. Uh, you know, we're told when you are afraid of something, you know, dial 911 or you have an emergency. I said, you know what the Christian 911 is? Psalm 911. Let me close with this. Listen to the words of it. Listen to our hope. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. 
You will not be afraid of the terror by night, or of the arrow that flies by day, or of the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. That's salvation, folks. Thanks for listening. Thank you for your prayerful support of Freedom in Christ Ministries. All of our content is made possible by you. Your generous support and financial gifts make these videos and our ministry possible. For more information on how to support our ministry, please visit www.freedominchrist.org and click Get Involved.